Greetings, I'm Zachary Hepner. I'm pleased to share this Tvar Torah with you for Parshat Bo. There is an interesting Parshat Bo inclusion. It's the eyes and the heart. In the penultimate verses before Parshat Bo, Pharaoh tells Moses that God is righteous while he and his nation are wicked. Moses prays for the hail to stop. Pharaoh sees that the hail had ceased and he sins further, and he hardens his heart. He and his ministers. Then Parshat Bo begins. Go to Pharaoh, since I have hardened his heart and the heart of his ministers to place signs in his midst. And so you will talk about these signs with your future generations. Interesting that once Pharaoh has hardened his heart, God hardens it further. Midrash Rabbah reads, Rabbi Yochanan claimed, since God hardened his heart, Pharaoh has a defense in the heavenly court. Reish Lakish responds, God gave him five chances and he paid no attention. Said the Holy One, blessed be he, you have stiffened your neck and hardened your heart. I will add impurity onto your impurity, like a liver that is double cooked and artasis appears in them. Similarly, Pharaoh's heart was unable to receive God's word. Parenthetically, it's worth digressing into the grave discussion of free will as axiomatic to Judaism. Was Pharaoh in heaven um, exonerated for his actions that were under divine duress? On this topic, the the paradox of God's knowledge in the future and free will and reward and punishment, let me very briefly present two possible solutions. The first answer is given by my Eshet Chayil, my wise wife. Whether God knows the future or whether we actually do or do not have free will is irrelevant as long as the imitation game that we are playing gives us the true impression that we have free will and are able to make our own decisions, then as far as we are concerned, God's knowledge is no contraindication to the spiritual benefit we receive from our exercising of our supposed free will. That's one explanation. Let me present one other explanation. This is a Wittgenstein explanation. We use words to present paradoxes, but the words we use are only avatars of the objects and subjects that we are referring to. What we conceptualize as God and knowledge and time and free choice and a constraint and reward and punishment, these are only words that reflect to the best of our ability what we're referring to. In our limited knowledge, we can present a paradox, but it is no more meaningful than an alliteration because We don't really understand what any of the words in the paradox means. While Wittgenstein's philosophy may seem like a cop-out, he might be one of the only secular philosophers that would acknowledge that behind Pshat there are 70 meanings, one deeper than the other, and they are all unfathomable. Now back to Parashat Bo inclusion. Bo begins with eyes, heart, signs. Let's skip to the end of the parsha, the penultimate and ultimate verse. Pharaoh was reluctant to send you, so God smote their firstborn. Therefore you sacrifice your firstborn animals and redeem your firstborn son. Place the sign on your arms and the totafot between your eyes because God took you out of Egypt with a strong hand. There are signs, stubbornness, eyes, and arms. These are all themes, but something is missing. Throughout Shmot, Vayera, and Bo, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Achabed et libo. And finally, at the end of Parsha Bo, when retelling the, negative, re- retelling the narrative, Ki Hiksha, 
Pharaoh was stubborn, no mention of his heart. And then again with the tefillin, the text does not mention the heart, but the arm. Perhaps it could mean next to the heart, but it doesn't say that. Funny, until this moment, we wondered whether or not Pharaoh had any say, or if God was making him do it. It wasn't my fault. The cat ate my homework. The Torah emphatically places the blame on Pharaoh. Man up. You made yourself stubborn. God only helped you become the stubborn leader you wanted to be. There are four parashiyot that are written in the tefillin boxes. Two from Exodus 13, Deuteronomy 6, and Deuteronomy 11. V'haya lo'ot ayadcha u'lzekaron be'neinecha. V'haya lo'ot ayadcha u'letotafot be'neinecha. Ukshartam lo'ot ayadcha v'hayu letotafot be'neinecha. And the last one, Ukshartem otam lo'ot ayadchem v'hayu letotafot be'neinechem. But wait, there is one more parasha that is not included, the missing parsha. The sages needed to include a section from the Torah to conclude every recitation of Kriyat Shema. So they chose Numbers 15, the commandment of fringes, tzitzit, because it includes remembering the Exodus and the performance of kol mitzvotai, all my commandments, which is tied to the mitzvah of tzitzit. I claim that the sages saw one more connection to clinch this as the fifth parasha of tefillin that never made the cut. Because in that section it says, V'lo taturu achare levavchem v'achare enechem. Do not stray after your hearts and eyes in your lustful urge. The mention of the hearts and eyes directly links this narrative to the tefillin and to the exodus. The story of suffering, servitude, and redemption is guided by the Almighty, but is a story of human choices. Don't blame your choices on your eyes or your heart, because the sinner bears the blame. And keep God's word close to you as possible, with tefillin, shema, mezuzot, Torah learning, and the last on the list, tzitzit. Wishing you all a Shabbat Shalom.